that the density and the temperature and everything in the universe has evolved over time. Uh, this next slide, uh, and I don't expect you to, to, to know anything about the graph. Um, I was telling the, the physics students a little bit earlier today, uh, and you have great physics students here. I really enjoy being with them. Very, very thoughtful and smart. Um, uh, I was telling them that whenever you give a popular talk, you should never have a graph. Um, but this graph, um, each unit, here's one second. This is one second after the Big Bang. This is the beginning of the universe over here. This is one second after the beginning of the universe. This is 10 to the 10th seconds, or about 300 years. Each unit going this way is about 10 billion times the unit before it. Each unit here is 10 billion times smaller. Here we are now, about 14 billion years after the beginning. Here's when the first planets were formed. The first atoms were formed when the universe was about one second old. If you take one second and you divide it into 10 billion pieces, and you take one of those pieces, that's this point here since the beginning. If you take one of those 10 billionths of a second and divide it into 10 billion pieces and take one of those pieces, that puts us here. So you can see way back here, we are a tiny fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second since the beginning. Physics understands pretty well the evolution of the universe all the way back to around here with our mathematics and our physics. We don't know so well what happened in here, but there are modern cosmologists today who are working on what happened way back here, one ten billionth of one ten billionth of one ten billionth of one ten billionth of a second after t equals zero. Um, this is a paper, a, a, a professional paper in a, in a professional journal just last summer uh, by uh, Andre Lindy and a collaborator working on what happened in that first tiny fraction of a second. That's where physics is right now in understanding the evolution of the universe. And this is not just hand waving. This is one of the equations that appears in Lindy's paper. So the question is, what happened before t equals zero? Well, we don't know what happened before the very beginning, and we will never know, because there's no experiment that we can do that will tell us what happened before the beginning. We do have theories, uh, and I can just say that, that, uh, that most physicists believe that there were lots and lots of universes which are sort of indicated metaphorically by these, these spheres here, there were lots of universes that were coming into being and disappearing and coming into being and disappearing. And our universe was just one of those little bubbles that kept expanding and had the right conditions to make life. So I think now it's time to turn to religion. Uh, I think we're, we're right on the edge of what physics knows and what science knows and what it does not know. And to get our feet wet here, um, as, as we tiptoe into religion, um, I first wanted to, to uh, lay out a, a, a few issues where I think there's an intersection with science and religion and a few areas where I think there's no intersection. Um, uh, I think that there is an intersection between science and religion and the question of what created the universe. Because as, as I said before, uh, science cannot know what happened before T equals zero, before the Big Bang, before the origin. Um, so this is a, a, an area of, of uh, I think, interesting discussion between science and religion. Uh, also, the question of whether 
the laws of nature, for example, Galileo's law of falling bodies being one, are the laws of nature sufficient to explain everything in the physical universe? That is also at the intersection of science and religion. Do we have free will? Uh, of course, neuroscience um, is, is learning more and more about um, the way that neurons behave. Uh, when we learn things, uh, the way the neurons communicate with each other, but we really don't know exactly what's involved in the decision-making process. Um, are we, is there some random element in the decision-making process that would be a, a source of free will, or is everything completely determined by the previous chemical and electrical states of those neurons? I think, of course, Free will has to do with ethics and morality, um, and so it brings in uh, religious considerations there. Some questions and issues where I think there is no overlap between science and religion. First of all, ethics and morality. Uh, science can say all at once about the way neurons behave in the brain, but, but science cannot really make authoritative statements about ethics and morality. Uh, I don't think that scientists have any more authority than anyone else to talk about ethics and morality. I think that is an area that lies more in religion. Uh, the meaning of life. Uh, uh, I don't think that science will ever be able to answer the question, uh, does life have a meaning? Or even whether there's any meaning at all. Um, this is, of course, an issue that is uh, debated in theological circles. I think this is an issue that lies completely in religion and outside of science. Uh, the existence of God, um, I, I think that uh, science will never be able to disprove the existence of God. Um, I think that religion will never be able to prove the existence of God. But I think the discussion of this lies squarely in the camp of religion. On the other hand, I think that all issues related to the nature of the physical universe lie completely within the domain of science. And I'll talk about that um, in a little bit more, uh, a little bit more in a, in a moment. So what is the, a kind of religious belief that would be completely compatible with science? And to answer that question, let me first uh, discuss with you very, very briefly something I call the central doctrine of science. The central doctrine of science is the belief that all phenomena in the physical universe are governed by laws, and that those laws apply everywhere and every time in the universe. Now, my graduate thesis advisor at Caltech never discussed the central doctrine of science with me explicitly. It was just implicit. Uh, it's something that all, I shouldn't say all, but most scientists uh, believe it and work by it either consciously or unconsciously. Um, it's sort of the rule of faith of science. Well, um, to go to the next step, um, I would like to define a working, a working definition of, of God. Um, now, I am uh, uh, not nearly presumptuous enough to think that I or anyone else uh, knows what God is. Uh, but for our purposes, um, for this discussion, um, I will postulate that God is a being that lives outside of time and space and is not subject to the laws of nature, is not restricted by the laws of nature. And every religion that I know on earth has a, a form of the deity which, which obeys this definition, as well as many other things. So, given this uh, definition of the central doctrine of science, which I think that almost all scientists hold, 